My favorite supplement? Magnesium's got to be up there because it's great for so many different things and people generally feel a lot better when they when they take it initially, right? They get yeah. that little nice little relaxation effect or better sleep. Hello, and welcome to the Physical Preparation Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Robertson, and I'll be joined on the line later today by Dr. Mark Bubbs. Now, normally when we would jump into these episodes, I would you know, ramble on and on. I would tell you a little bit about my week. But in the interest of getting all of my holiday episodes done, not only for my benefit, but also for the amazing people at Podcast Network Solutions who help me produce this show, we are going to change formats just for a couple weeks get everything done, and instead, what I'm gonna give you is one actionable item or one thought for each of the next five weeks to help you ensure that 2021 is your best year ever. Now look, I wanna set the bar high here because if we just said better than 2020, that wouldn't be very hard, right? I think most of us would agree 2020 hasn't been the best year that we've been alive, so how can we make sure, how can we ensure that 2021 is our best year ever. Well, this week, my number one thing that I wanna talk to you about is this idea of setting goals. Now, maybe setting goals is something you've done for your entire life and it's old hat to you. Maybe it's something you've never done before, but I can tell you from firsthand experience, the times and even more specifically, the years where I've set very specific goals for myself are the years that I've been the most successful and that I've gotten the most demonstrable changes in numerous areas of my life. So with that being said, I think it's important that we have two types of goals. We have our outcome-based goals and we have our process-based goals. And I think it's really important to tie these together. So when it comes to an outcome, an outcome-based goal would be, I wanna lose 20 pounds or I wanna add 50 pounds to my squat. Like those are fantastic goals and that's great. But also know and understand that just setting that goal and then doing nothing to accomplish it, it doesn't just magically happen. There has to be a process behind it. So what I like to do is I like to set an outcome-based goal, but then I like to put process-based goals underneath that. So let's take that idea of I want to lose 20 pounds in the next three to six months. If that's the case, what are some actionable items or some process-related items that you could do every day, every week? to help make sure that you do that. For instance, if you wanna lose 20 pounds, you could say, I wanna go to the gym and work out three days a week. I want to make sure I have four to five whole food meals every day, making sure I hit whatever my macros are and making sure that I get enough protein in at every meal, right? So you come up with these process related goals. So what that does is you can reevaluate the end of your three month or six month period. And you can very clearly say outcome based goal. Did I lose 20 pounds? Yes or no. And if the answer is no, then you can go back to the process goals and you can say, okay, maybe these didn't work and I need to change those. But more importantly, you can also hang your hat on. Okay. Even if they didn't work, it's not that I wasn't a thousand percent successful. I didn't achieve my outcome based goal, but I adhered to these principles. And I think that's really important. If you can check the box of, hey, I worked out three times a week, I followed my nutritional program, but I still didn't achieve my goal. Okay, well now it just tells you, you need to change something, right? Maybe you were focusing too much on lifting heavy weights and not getting enough cardiovascular activity in, or maybe your nutrition was on point, but you weren't getting enough protein in, or maybe you were doing all the right things and your recovery wasn't where it needed to be. So over the next three months, you wanna continue on this path, but you need to make sure you get enough sleep each and every night. You see where I'm going with this? There's a lot of ways that you can skin this cat, but I think if you wanna be successful in 2021, you need to be solid about setting goals. Find, doesn't matter, it could be an hour, it could be two hours, it could be an entire day in the next three to four weeks to really hash out what is important to you, what do you wanna get out of 2021, and what goals do you wanna achieve? And if you take the time to do that, you set these outcome and process-based goals, I guarantee you're gonna be far more successful because you're very clear on what it is you wanna accomplish next year.
So I hope this has been helpful for you. Again, the next four weeks, I'm gonna keep adding and layering onto these, but that's enough for me for today. Quick message from my sponsor, i.e. me, and then we'll jump into this week's episode. Hey friend, Mike Robertson here. And before we jump into this week's episode, I wanna talk to you about something real quick. If you're listening to this show, you realize the power of coaches. Whether you're a trainer or coach yourself or an athlete who has worked with coaches in the past, you know how hard it is to accomplish truly amazing feats on your own. And I'm no different. In fact, I've come to the realization that while 2020 wasn't awful, I'm definitely not where I wanna be yet in life. And as such, I'm gonna be hiring multiple coaches in 2021 to help get me back on track. But here's the thing, sometimes you want coaching, but simply can't afford a private coach. After all, I realize whether it's in person or online, my private coaching program isn't for everybody. But what if I could still help you in more of a group style program? If this sounds interesting at all, my annual training group could be a perfect fit for you. In this program, we go through four three month phases of training, building the engine, leaning season, athletic domination, and stronger. But the cool part of this program is that it's more than just a training program. Every month, you'll not only get a new workout to follow, but we'll also add in monthly challenges where we develop habits with regards to nutrition, recovery, and mindset to help ensure that next year is your best year ever. Trust me, I know 2020 hasn't always been kind to our habits and our routines, so this portion of the program alone could be worth the price of admission. If you're interested in learning more about the annual training group, head on over to robertsontrainingsystems.com forward slash annual. Again, that's robertsontrainingsystems.com forward slash annual. Or if you have any questions or concerns, or just want to learn more about the program, shoot me an email at mike at robertsontrainingsystems.com. Okay, that's enough from me. Thanks so much for listening. And I'd love the chance to work with you and help make 2021 your best year ever. Dr. Mark Bubbs is a naturopathic doctor, performance nutrition lead for Canada Basketball, and performance nutrition consultant for a portfolio of professional and Olympic athletes. Mark is the author of the best-selling book, Peak, The New Science of Athletic Performance That is Revolutionizing Sports, an Integrated and Personalized Approach to Health, Nutrition, Training, Recovery, and Mindset. Mark also hosts the Performance Nutrition Podcast, connecting listeners with world-leading experts in human performance and health, and regularly speaks at health, fitness, and medical conferences across North America, the UK, and Europe, and practices in both Toronto, Canada, and London, England. In this show, Dr. Bubbs and I take a deep dive into all things nutrition. We start by talking about the importance and meaning behind human-first, food-first, and behavior-first nutrition. From there, we talk a lot about macros, including how much you should be getting of each, where most athletes are successful, and where they may be under-fueling themselves. All in all, this show was a ton of fun. Mark has a really balanced viewpoint on nutrition, and I think you're going to love it. But enough for me, let's do this. Mark, man, thanks so much for coming on the show here today. Very excited to have you. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, appreciate uh, you having me on, Mike, carving out some time. Yeah, I work as the Performance uh, Nutrition Lead with Canada Basketball and consultants as well. So working with you know, athletes at all different levels and, and also in, in general practice. So working with you know, clients who are trying to improve their blood pressure or blood sugars or lose a bit of weight. I love it. I love it, man. And what originally led you to the world of physical preparation? Like, how did you get started in all this? Yeah, you know, I think like a lot of people, I was really into sports growing up, you know, in high school, played everything. And and as I got to my senior years, all of a sudden I was getting run down and sick. I mean, just really flattened me, lost a bunch of weight. And I just thought, what's going on here? And you know, the doctors couldn't really figure it out. And somebody told me to go down the road and check out a nutritionist. And all of a sudden, I ate a little bit more of this and less of that. And I felt I felt like I was back on track. I, could, I couldn't believe that it would seem so simple, yet nobody, you know, and this is going back 20 plus years. So nutrition has come a long way definitely since then, but the medicine as well. But but yeah, so that was kind of the first thing that, that really kind of clicked. And then, you know, from there, just decided with the sport, nutrition, you know, it did really work well. I love it. I love it, man. Yeah, I I was talking with one of my coaches today and kid walks in, my kid walks in with a Starbucks organic like breakfast sandwich. I think, man, come a long ways from the bacon, egg and cheese from McDonald's I used to get growing up. So <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> nutrition game has definitely evolved. So, okay. Well, last but not least, talk to me about your career path. You know, like how did, 
what's, what's your, your school background? And then kind of walk us through to like where you're at today. Yeah, I mean, I took a bit in terms of sport, a little bit of an unconventional path because in university, I went to UBC. So that's out in Vancouver in Canada and was doing, you know, pre-med studies. And as I mentioned, I got really into nutrition and this is going back into the late 90s. And all of a sudden I'm asking doctors about nutrition and exercise for helping their patients. And it's, you know, you get a lot of head nods like, hey, that sounds like a great idea, but we really, really don't have time for it and we don't use it very much. And it, you know, became a bit dissuaded around, okay, well, how am I going to, is this really going to work in terms of, you know, is this how I want to spend my days? And so, you know, like most people at that time, I just took a bunch of years off after university and then <laughs> worked as a trainer and traveled abroad. And and that's when I really realized just working as a, as a personal trainer in London, England, actually, you know, we tweak some clients diets and, and the weight would start coming off and they start feeling better. And you, you just started, you really hit it home. Like, okay, when you, if we can get people to move better and just eat a little bit better, you know, whether it's performance based or definitely on the health side of things. And so, yeah, it's been cool to see in the last two decades, it's really come full circle where virtually every doctor, you know, you go in and, and nutrition and exercise are really at the forefront and things like sleep. And so, you know, really cool to kind of see that come through. And so for me, I, I went back to actually pursue a naturopathic medical degree, which is, uh, you know, being able to use a bit more nutrition and then applying that because I had always had the background in sport, I was working with Canada basketball on the physical preparation side and then, you know, use that nutrition lens to yep. be able to then kind of amplify that. And, and you know, as a performance nutritionist now, it's, it's served me well because having some experience in that sort of general medicine or being able to help people's health, right? Because at the end of the day, if we can make keep athletes healthy, you know, performance tends to follow yeah, I love that. And explain to me one thing, like what what distinguishes a naturopath from other types of doctors? Because you hear that that term used a lot. And I honestly don't know what like distinctions or, or what the differences are between that and some of the other degrees. Yeah. So in, uh, you know, in various provinces in Canada and states in the U.S., it's a, it's a full four year degree. And, you know, places like Ontario, you have, you know, doctor title, you can prescribe medication. So you're, you're sort of getting an education like a, a medical doctor, although you're using just tools like, you know, your nutrition, your exercise, lifestyle. You know, you're not dealing with with emergent medical conditions. So yeah, you're not sure. dealing with things that you'd see in the OR and the ER, that type of thing. Uh, you're dealing more with the chronic conditions like your diabetes, your, okay. your, your heart disease, things like that. I love that. That's cool, man. I like that. So let's start kind of basic and then we can kind of deep dive from there. Yeah. But what I would love to hear are just like your foundational philosophies or your big rocks with regards to sports nutrition. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think we touched on the first one, which is that idea of, of human first, we call it, you know, we use that yes. term of kind of the basketball, that idea of, again, if we can create healthy people, right, they happen to be athletes, but if we can create healthy people, they can show up to training every day. They can deal with the rigors, the intensity, the training load, and be able to adapt accordingly. We see this especially, you know, in team sports where, you know, hey, dealing in basketball, you know, if you're six foot eight and you've got a 40 inch vertical leap and you can run like the wind, you, you got a pretty good chance. <laughs> right. So if we, if we can keep you healthy and keep you on the court, then that's a big part of it. So human first is a big piece. And that goes for, you know, whether it's endurance or team sport. And that, that bleeds into the next one, which is food first. You know, we've got to we've got to be able to fuel athletes with with food. You know, I mean, there's definitely a place for supplementation, especially when we're really dealing at the at the knife's edge of, of high performance and trying to, to nail those marginal gains. And, and, you know, we we do need to apply some strategies there, but we've definitely got to zoom out to 30,000 feet and just say, well, what's going into this athlete's diet? And, you know, you see now at the professional level, I mean, teams are spending a lot of money on performance facilities and kitchens and chefs. And so that's tremendous but even and even at the collegiate level as well but you know our younger athletes our high school athletes even collegiate athletes even with all that access there's still there's still some gaps and so yeah you know, being able to support them with with you know which leads into the last one which is behaviors right behavior first if we gotta rather than just giving someone a, a list of hey here's what you're gonna eat here's the menu you know it's it's how do i ingrain the behaviors so you know if you're an athlete you just if you don't eat five or six times a day it feels weird yeah like what's going on this is, what's happened today something's something's not right versus you know you can still have guys playing in the nba that eat three square meals and yes if you're trying to lose 30 pounds and you're hypertensive and pre-diabetic that's a pretty darn good strategy but if you're logging you know 35 minutes in a, a night in the nba and training hard then it's tough to get all the fuel that you need to get in to be able to really perform for a long period of time yeah. I think that was one of the things that we talked before we started about your book and how much I'm enjoying it. But just that idea of human first, of food first, like I just feel like still in this day and age, this is such such a massive, such a massive area where we can see huge gains. And there's still like, I mean, 
I'll give you an example. And you mentioned college athletes because I get a fair amount and yeah, you know they've sure. got training tables and they've got access to all these nutritional resources. But man, I have kids that come in and they, they've spent two or three years at university and they come home, they can't cook a meal. Like they don't understand like just basic food choices because it's always been put in front of them. So I think yeah. it's just like you said, there, there's elements to it, right? Human first, food first, behavior first. Man, there's that education side of it too. That I feel like some of these athletes, not all, but some of these athletes definitely need just to teach them, hey, like this is you're checking these boxes here, but these are some things that you need to be able to do to fuel your body appropriately for the sport that you play. Yeah, I mean, you nailed it, especially even at the elite level now, because they're so young when they go into the elite level that now if they don't have someone doing these things for them, they literally, you know, it's like the university <laughs> student. They don't know how to even cook a chicken breast or yeah. prepare in vegetables or any of that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's, it's good life skills. And then hopefully we can get it started in high school and stuff these days rather than I don't know if they're still cooking tiramisu's and things in home ec, but it's like, <laughs> <laughs> let's get some real skills here on how to cook some actual food rather than, you know, desserts and pastries. Yeah. The first thing I cooked in home ec was the surprise muffin. Muffin with a little bit of jam in the middle, and we got a D on ours. It was so bad I could throw it against the wall, and it didn't <laughs> deform. So I knew that I needed a little nice. bit of sturdy. <laughs> I needed a little bit of work on my food game. So I love that man. Human first, food first, behavior first. So I know you work with a, a, a lot of basketball players, but at the same time, yeah. I want to do our best to to keep this broad. So that sure. everybody who's listening in can kind of take some some key points away. With regards to macros, and you hear people talk about macros and macronutrients all the time. Yep. Where do you see most athletes maybe hitting the mark? And where is there potential room for improvement? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I think if you look at team sports, you know, the, the research these days, the last 20 years of, of telling everyone to drink their protein shake and get enough protein in. You know, when we look at professional soccer or football, as they call it in, in Europe, you know, they're, they're achieving over 200 grams a day and, and similarly in sports like basketball. And so when we look at protein, that looks like it's a bucket that's pretty well covered. I'd say there's probably still some nuances with, you know, we think of the three T's when it comes to protein, your total, your timing and your type. And so the total tends to be taken care of. It's more the timing, you know, spreading it out evenly throughout the day. And, and again, it doesn't matter if you're high school or playing in the NBA, that breakfast meal is always the trickiest one to get that 20 grams of protein minimum that we're looking for. And so that's one where, you know, even pouring yourself a pint of milk, 500 mils of milk, I mean, that's 16 grams of protein. If you're plant-based, hey, go for soy milk there, you get the right. same 16 grams, but right. that's an easy way or a protein shake or whatever, but, but that's a meal where we tend to miss. And then the type is just kind of eating a variety of different types of protein, right? I mean, I think this is where we can get on that for some athletes, if they are eating animal proteins, it ends up being chicken, chicken, chicken all the time. And, you know. We do want to get some diversity, the darker the cut of meat, the different micronutrients and, and you know, vitamins, minerals you're going to be bringing on board. So that's key. And exploring, especially for the younger athletes, again, whether it's fish, seafood, you know, get in there, mussels, scallops, right. you know, shrimp, like be a little adventurous there because you're going to, you know, when we talk about things like even mussels, you're bringing on board not only protein, but tons of omega-3 and again, really nutrient dense. And so, you know, just building that out as you go, it takes time, but that's, yeah, for that's sure. one to, to think about. And the next one would be, you know, in terms of fueling, we talked a bit about just the demands, you know, the accelerations, decelerations, stop, start of us, whether it's basketball, soccer, all these team sports are, you're burning so many more calories than you would in even an intense session in the gym. Yes. You know, and I think because historically so much of nutrition is from a, you know, almost a bodybuilding lens in terms of how we prescribe things that it's different when we talk about team sport, because we're not trying to you know, make the cover of a magazine, you know, even though some guys and gals genetically will be very lean and ripped without sort of trying, but that's, you know, we've, we've got a fuel for, for what the demands are. And so this is where carbohydrate intake becomes really key. And because the messaging in the general population, you know, again, that client who's, and it might even be the parent of the athlete, maybe they've got 20 or 30 pounds to lose, you know, for them, reducing carbohydrate can be a nice strategy because, you know, let's be honest, most of the junk food in our diets is a lot higher in carbs. And so yes. when you tell someone to go on a low carb diet, you know, you eliminate five out of six of the top most calorific foods. And so that's a pretty nice way to do it. The trouble is when an athlete sees that and then just starts taking the advice of a friend or, a you know, aunt or uncle or whoever, now all of a sudden we get into a problem because they need more fuel. And so, you know, that's a big one, especially when you start to play multiple games in a week or if you're in a high school or collegiate setting where you're playing multiple games in a day. I mean, that's when we really, in that compressed schedule, 
that's where it really becomes important. And that's where eating things that, you know, we don't consider healthy, you know, or, or, you know, maybe it's more juice or maybe it is having something that's got a lot more energy density. You know, if you're going to have candy, like, hey, you got three games that day, you know, right after the game, let's get that, let's get the glucose right in there into the muscles, into those, it's the fast twitch fibers that really get hit post game, right? So when we're getting the carbohydrates in, we're not just topping up glycogen, but those fast twitch fibers that are going to really need it. And so having some strategies, you know, if you're a high school collegiate coach, if you're you know strength coach working with the team, having some strategies where, you know, maybe we are going to bring on board some juice or adding some honey to this or that, or maybe it's the PB and J's are going down after, you know, whatever, yeah. whatever you have access to, there's ways of, of being able to get that in. Cause you do want the foods that make people want to eat more versus, yeah. You know, hey, broccoli is great for you, but heads of broccoli after the game is going to fill up your players and you're not going to be able to get all the fuel you need in. And so, again, it's sort of the difference between when we talk fueling for health in the general population versus our athletes who are, again, we want them to be healthy. But when it's competition time, we got to really have our fueling hat on and figure out what they're using when they play and how much we need to to to, re, to refuel, to rebuild afterwards. I love it. I love it. And I, I was fascinated by that because I guess I would have thought that protein was more of an issue. And maybe that's some of the the athletes that I've worked with, but I was really fascinated by that. And I love that answer. So I'm going to actually jump ahead here because I think this is going to kind of segue nicely. How do you deal with, you know, like you kind of alluded to, how do you deal with that athlete that is fearful of carbohydrates? Maybe they've struggled with their body weight or their body fat in the past, but you also know they need the carbs to refuel. How do you kind of find that balance there? Yeah, and that's an interesting one because I think a lot of times, and you see this in strength and conditioning as well, but I think more so in, in nutrition and definitely in medicine, is we always try to you know, appeal to the analytical side of, of a client or an athlete, right? We're trying to tell them the information that's most relevant. Like if I just give them the right knowledge, the right information, then they're going to change their behavior. Right. And of course you talk to any psychologist and even if you think you're really rational, 90% of all the decisions that we make (laughs) are not our rational brain, right? It's all the subconscious. And so, you know, Chip and Dan Heath, there's a great book they wrote called Switch talking about the, the rider and the elephant and this idea, the elephants being the subconscious mind. And how do we appeal to that to that elephant, how do we get? How do we start to then appeal to that identity of the individual or whatnot to start to to change some of these behaviors? So I think that's one of the big things around. You know, if we circle back to protein intake, a lot of athletes still think protein is just for my muscles, right? And if I got enough muscle, then I don't need to eat protein. Well, you know, if you're a house, protein are the bricks, and the and the faster and more you're moving, you're taking bricks out of the house, and so we need to put them back in there, so we don't get you know these non-contact injuries because soft tissue is going to be affected. You know, we're in the COVID times now, immune system, immune system function. Yep. You know, we always think obviously vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, these things are important, but your protein intake is really important too. And so, you know, trying to, to, to have the right kind of language that might start to light that fire internally for the athlete to start to, to, to make those changes. So, you know, coming back to the carbohydrate question, I mean, if we want to get analytical, we tell them, well, hey, the best figure competitors and bodybuilders in the world who are absolutely peeled and ripped are consuming four to five grams per kilogram body weight per day, which is a heck of a lot. Right. And they're super lean. Right. And so we need to put the fuel in to be able to deal with with the demands. And then if we want to get more uh, to maybe the to the elephant or be more kind of general with how we do it, I mean, I like to always polarize kind of the general population versus athletes Mm. and just talk about how like you know, hey, that is a great strategy, like low carb, that can help a lot for weight loss. But we tend to use that most with, with you know, folks who are trying to lose 20 or 30 pounds, if they're hypertensive, pre-diabetic, you know, does that sound like you, you know, you're sort of talking it through to the athlete a little bit so they can make that connection around, hey, the athletes over here, we're trying to get them to eat five or six times a day. And we're trying to, you know, we can certainly have meals within that that are lower carbohydrate, or we have sessions where it's, it's strategic and it's planned. There's a reason why we're reducing that fuel to elicit a certain adaptation, but we're making sure that for the day we've got enough energy on board because otherwise, you know, and you see it in collegiate sport and elite sport, halfway through, two thirds of the way through the season, playoff time, now all of a sudden we're getting fatigue, we're getting sick, and and this is where, you know, it's a bit like a 100 meter sprint where it looks like Usain Bolt speeding up at the end, but everyone else is just slowing down faster ah, than he is, yeah, right? Yeah. And so that's kind of what we're trying to do on the nutrition front towards the end of the season is just be able to keep our athletes just 
moving forward as best we can and not, not really slowing down like the rest of the pack. Oh, that's really interesting. So I think as, as physical prep coaches, we would think of like that long-term chronic fatigue that you would see over the course of a season, right? But are you saying like there's almost more of like a chronic underfueling that maybe like towards the end of the year, it like hits a tipping point or a threshold? Yeah, I mean, I think we, if we look at like if training loads high and sleep is low, we're going to be more exposed to injury. Yeah. And if we layer on top of that, you know, low energy availability or, you know, a fancy way of saying you're not eating enough calories, enough energy, then you're in a really good spot to, you know, to struggle with injury or, yeah. or infection, right? And so those three things tend to accumulate at that certain time. And that's when from us, you know, even from an S&C standpoint, just throwing in those reminders around, you know, if we, if we establish that behavior of eating five or six times a day, now the athlete, even if they feel full, which is always the problem, right? You train hard, you kind of don't feel like eating all the time. But because they have that behavior, they know it's weird. Okay, I didn't have anything. I better make sure I have that shake or that snack. Yeah. Whereas if we don't check on it, all of a sudden that athlete's only eating two or three meals a day and we're into April and it's almost playoff time. And we're wondering why we're, you know, we don't have that first step or we're getting tired, sick, injured, that type of thing. Yeah. Man, shakes are such a game changer. I don't know. I just always come back to like a lot of my guys and, and you wouldn't think. You know, a lot of guys that are in the NBA, you would think, oh, this guy, I mean, he just looks like a normal dude, like he's ripped or he's tall or whatever. But you wouldn't think that they struggle to keep weight on or to add weight. And a lot of them do. I mean, the shake for a lot of these guys is such a game changer as far as helping them either put on weight or keep weight on because you're right. Like, man, five, six times a day, if you're really eating whole foods five or six times a day, sometimes that's hard. It's really yeah, challenging. It's a, it's a full-time job and one that most <laughs> trainers would gladly sign up for. But right. <laughs> right. It makes it even more, uh, you know, challenging. But yeah, the portable nutrition, you add a shake in there and then just something that tastes good. Like maybe, it, maybe it's a date square or, or, you know, some type of banana muffin or something that's that's moorish and makes them want to eat, right? Yeah. You got you to gotta trigger that appetite with something. To, and that's where pre or post can be a good time for that, a little bit of that sweetness. I love that. Awesome. Well, one other thing that I found really interesting in your book is this kind of natural tendency for for athletes during the week to kind of wave or cycle their carbohydrate intake or maybe reduce it a little bit during the week. But especially as they got around game day or on game day, that carbohydrate kind of started to crank back up. So I'm interested in your opinion here. Why do you think that is? I mean, is that a conscious choice or is that something that's been ingrained in them like fuel, fuel, fuel day of? Why do you think they do that? It's interesting. Yeah, that, that came out of research out in the UK around professional footballers and English premiership. And, you know, more research on the endurance side was coming out, showing that, hey, high carb is great on, on competition day. But if we actually strategically lower the carb on some practice days, we can again get these beneficial adaptations, you know, training adaptations. And so, you know, that's trickled down into the into the pro football, pro soccer terrain over there. And, and I think a lot of the reminders are probably coming from the staff on pre-game day and game day to make sure that we're getting enough fuel on board to make sure when they go visit the facilities that they're, you know, taking that meal, not only having the lunch, but that little packet, that meal that the chef's prep for them, yeah. <laughs> giving them the rush, wagging the finger, being like, make sure you eat that when you get home. Right. Um, so I think that's, that's part of it. I think there's probably a bit of, you know, environmental again, athletes want to be lean too, and they, they see the low carb stuff. So naturally they might dip a little bit midweek if they if they feel like they're trying to get lean. Yeah. But it is it is interesting because, you know, it's there are some big benefits to being able to periodize like that, to be able to have to not be having to fuel high carbohydrate all the time. And, you know, if we bring that conversation around to, to collegiate sport in the US, I mean, I think that's one where we tend to see maybe a bit too much overemphasis on like you need to eat 500 grams of carbs today and you're going to eat that 500 grams every single day. Right. And I think I think that's when we can struggle because we just a young athlete's going to get fatigued from trying to eat that amount. Yep. And now rather than kind of prioritizing, hey, these are the game days when we really need to get this stuff in, you know, we're trying to do it every day of the week. And now two or three months into the into the year, if you actually look at the athlete's intake, it's down quite significantly. So I think there's a place to maybe, you know, pick your battles a little bit in terms of because, again, athletes are human. You know, we, we would all love to eat and have food prepared for us, but it's, it can be a full time job. And so, you know, you, you can only wag your finger and, and, and get get athletes to do it so much of the time. And so I think that's, a you know, maybe an area if, if people listening in notice some struggles to think about. 
I love that. I love that. Okay. So lots of talk about carbs. Let's switch <laughs> gears here. And I, I want the truth, man. You're my guy on this. So is there any reason to take in two to three grams of protein per pound of body weight? Like guys like you and I used to hear from the old muscle rags. Oh man, that was the classic. This is a cool one because there's some when we look at the bodybuilding research, you know, back in the day, this is where the doctors were always just shaking their heads going, these guys are idiots. What are they doing? I mean, their kidneys are going to explode, right? Their kidneys are going to explode. Um, <laughs> but now you see if in a caloric deficit, when you get above a gram per pound, you do get benefit, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you're an actually a bodybuilder, then, you know, going up above two towards three is a, is a pretty good strategy. The tricky part is if you're a team sport athlete, we don't want you to be in a caloric deficit, right? Like that's <laughs> right. not the goal. And so once you're in a caloric, a eucaloric state or a, or a caloric excess, then you don't need that much. You're not getting any extra benefit, right? Even if you get to 1.6 grams per kilogram per day, which is in pounds, maybe like 0.77 around there, 0.78. Yeah. So under a gram per pound, you're getting all the benefits. Hmm. And actually some interesting news, new research showing that it doesn't even matter if it's plant or animal based once you get to that threshold. So even oh, more, really? you know, so, so with team sport, you got to just make sure you're, you're hitting your total energy needs because then the onus on protein comes down a little bit. And the thing to remember too, is if you're really pushing protein hard and protein is more filling and, and creates more satiety. Well, that actually makes it harder for your guy or your gal to consume 3,500 or 4,000 calories, right? Because now you're now you're taking away from the other parts of the meal that they're supposed to be filling up on on the rice or the the shake or whatever else. So I think that's one where, you know, hey, it's an easy one to keep <laughs> ringing the bell for protein because it does do so many fantastic things in the body. It is a big pillar for for setting athletes and people up for for success, but. Yeah, I mean, at that point, it's uh, especially if they're pounding it back with shakes. I mean, that's when it's like, okay, we're good. We got the one point six. Right. <laughs> you can right. take your foot off the gas pedal now. Let's shift the focus to another area, because ultimately, that's what we're after too. I mean, that habit based. If they if they naturally get to one point six, and you don't have to, you know, we don't need to keep telling them. Perfect. Let's move to some other area to focus on because that's that's already automated. They're good to go. Absolutely. And what were your three T's again? Timing, type. What was the third? So the first is a uh, yeah, total. So total. hit that. And it goes for carbs as well, like carb total, carb timing, carb type. So we can make sure that we're – and total is always that first one you want to hit because you want to just make sure you're getting that, you know, that, that total amount that that athlete needs. But then from there, we get a bit more nuanced saying, okay, are we spreading it out at the right times? And, and for things like carbs, it becomes more are we getting the simple carbs you know, immediately before, during, or immediately after training versus you know, if we keep talking the NBA, the 1 o'clock in the morning bag of Oreos, that's not – that's not the best time to be doing that right? <laughs> that's right before you go to bed. Right. And so, and for young athletes too, I mean, maybe parents listening in, if you have a, you know, even like a sports drink too far before a game or practice, if we're talking 45 minutes or an hour and you knock back that Gatorade, by the time you get to, to game time, your glucose levels are dropping down. You're going to get into this, you know, hypoglycemic state before, before tip off or before kickoff. And so now if your team keeps coming out sluggish, you know, either to start the game or out of the second half, you want to start thinking about, wait a minute, what are we, you know, we've got to try to keep those simple sugars to really up close to when you're playing. So then that kind of 10, 15, 20 minute mark rather than, you know, an hour, an hour and a half before you play. Right. Yeah. That was something when, I mean, I don't, I don't do a ton of endurance based work myself, obviously <laughs> powerlifting background, you know, the old joke, anything over fives is cardio. But yeah, I found that really interesting. Like, I guess I'd never thought about that. Yeah. If you're drinking whatever Gatorade or whatever kind of sports drink you're drinking 90 minutes before the game, by the time you get to tip off, you're already like blood sugars down. Like you're not getting the benefit that you would think it's actually working against you. So I thought that was a really great point. Yeah. And it's interesting because the research shows it's not just physical, but mental too. You're a little bit yes. slower cognitive function decision-making. So if you are playing a sport, you know, like a team sport where you're, there's a lot of inputs that you've got to navigate that's, yeah, it's not good. I love it. I love it. Okay. I'm going to put you on the spot here because I didn't, I didn't have anything in the questions about fat, but I want to talk about fat for a minute because Let's do it. I think a lot of times just the word fat freaks people out, right? Mm -hmm. Like protein is kind of okay. Carbs have kind of been vilified, but people are, there's still a lot of people that are genuinely scared of consuming fat. So kind of like the carb discussion, how do you navigate that discussion of, Hey, like how do you explain to people or what's your elevator pitch on? Hey, this is what fat does for you. This is why it's important. This is why you have to consume it to perform at a high level. Yeah. Again, it really depends on the individual around kind of yeah, what sure. angle we can use to, um, but 
you know, a great heuristic or tip is, you know, eat things that have one ingredient, avocado, yeah. you know, steak, rice, <laughs> pears, like things. If there's more than, okay, I'll give you olive oil. That's two words, but you know, those types right. of things where if we can keep it really short, then it's real food. And so you're going to be doing well. And, and this is where I think even government institutions haven't done a great job because the last round of, you know, the, the recommendations, dietary recommendations for Americans, they actually removed, they used to recommend, you know, 20 to 35% of your total calories come from fats and, you know, how any general person knows the percentage of calories that are coming from fats in their <laughs> diet. I mean, again, such a horrible way to give instructions, right? But they've actually removed that, but they didn't really, you know, there weren't trumpets or a parade or anything. And they sort of just, it was just in there. So if you do want to appeal to the analytical side, it's like, Hey, well, you know, there is no real upper limit on fat in the recommendations. You look at all the countries that live the longest, you know, Italy, France, uh, Spain, Spain will be the longest living by 2050. Uh, Japanese, wow. there's there's lots of fat in the diet, and it, but it's coming from just real food, whether it's animal proteins, whether it's vegetable fats, and so you know, getting back to kind of a real food versus processed food. You know, we do want that food first approach. Hey, they're athletes. We're going to need more fuel. Sometimes we're going to need some processed food just to get the yes, just to get the total fuel in because and and that's where my elevator pitch on the processed food side is especially to the parents, is it's like having a fireplace, right? When that fire is really hot, you can throw a lot of logs on there. They're just going to burn. It's not going to cause any issues. Whereas the general population, we throw the same amount of logs on, it puts out the fire, and now we're into now we're into problems, right? Yeah. Uh, but that's a really hard one for people to wrap their heads around of, of the fact that we're going to pump a lot of, sh you know, simple sugars into this athlete. Whereas if we did the same thing to an adult who's 40 or 50 or a little bit overweight, that would be a big problem. But again, like context is so key. As soon as you change the context, you know, the, just like in training, the suggestions are going to change, right? Yeah, I love that. It's, it's such a great, great point. And I love that analogy with the fireplace. That makes great sense because, yeah, we've all had we've all had that. Never been camping. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or you, we've all had that hard gainer, right? Like you just keep yeah. like throwing yeah. food at them and they just burn it up, man. Yeah, that's always funny because they always say, well, I've, I've, I've eaten this much and I just can't gain. You're like, you can eat more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I can. Like, yes, you can. Yeah. <laughs> we will find a way to make it happen. We, we'll show you. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay. So we've kind of danced around this, but I would love to get your thoughts on like pre and peri workout nutrition for most field or court sport athletes. We kind of touched on don't yep. drink your, your sugary glucose heavy sports drink 90 minutes out. So let's flip that. What can they be doing to maximize their performance, both maybe before or during a match or game? Yeah, I mean, I think the good first place to start is just trying to, as we talked about, keep that simple carb intake to really before the match and before the game, before the practice. And you know, even something like, it sounds kind of funny. I mean, you could actually swallow it, but it's carb mouth rinsing, which is basically just, oh, yeah. just the sensation of sugar in your mouth lights up areas of the brain that tr that stimulate the nervous system. So, you know, and if you watch the last World Cup, you see these guys just spitting all over the pitch, just like, you know, taking these bottles in from the physios and the water's coming right back out of their mouths. I mean, that's what they're doing. And so, you know, that that's a strategy. If you have, you know, we have a lot of players that, you know, when I used to play basketball, I didn't like the taste of, of too much sugar in my mouth from the sports drinks. You know, it, I like to have water and we have a lot of players like that as well. During a game, they actually don't like that sensation. And so that can be a strategy in that immediately pregame or coming out of halftime just as a way to kind of get that nervous system a bit lit up so they're they're back and, and tuned in for the game. From there, it's, it gets pretty individual. I mean, you know, I think something that if you have the means to, you know, getting a personalized sweat test on athletes is pretty key because it's not just the carbohydrates, but, you know, how much salt are we putting in? Uh, another, you know, whole conversation around general population. Yeah, we need yeah. less salt because you're eating too much processed food. But, you know, I've tested some athletes that lose you know, a thousand milligrams in a, in a one hour session, right? Wow. So are you going to drink five Gatorades to get that in? Like, so you're going to need more targeted, you know, electrolyte personalized formulas to, to be able to offset this. And this is what you might see in your bigger athletes as well. Like your, you know, your O and D linemen and football or your rugby players, maybe ice hockey players where, you know, adding more salt in can really help those athletes, whether it's during the session or after the session. So, you know, a couple things to think about there. Wow. Man, I've, I'll be honest, dude. I've been around the block. I've never heard of a personalized sweat test before. That's crazy. 
Yeah, it's. I mean, it's. Uh, there's all. You know, stuff's always coming out, and it's. It's. It's pretty cool just to see that the difference in, in sweat rate. Because again, you know, sport drinks are great to provide the electrolytes, but there is some pretty big differences from from one athlete to the next. And yeah, sure. And and like you alluded to, just sport to sport, right? Just thinking about the fueling demands from American football to soccer to basketball. I mean, one one that I'm kind of interested in right now is tennis. And I'll give a shout out to my online client, Amy, because she plays tennis and she's pretty into that. But just nice. thinking about like high level tennis matches, when you're going by yourself out there, all the changes, directions, accelerations, decelerations, playing for three to four hours, you don't get yeah. points off. So just thinking about how you would have to fuel yourself to play at a high level for that extended period of time. Yeah, tennis is interesting. Yeah, the length of the, how long, you know, three, four or five hours, you know, when you get out there. And uh, and again, if, if you're a so-called clean eater, this is where you've got to tell athletes, hey, I want you to add salt, like get that sea salt out and right. be pretty be pretty aggressive with it. Because again, the messaging maybe from mom or dad, if they might happen to be hypertensive, might be that we're yes. afraid of salt. And so again, we get these subconscious things that trickle down to, to, the, to the kids or to the family, whatever, from from other members that, that all of a sudden that's how the athlete fuels just, you know, because everyone around them and does in the family. Yes. Well, and, and like, let's be real here. Cause my wife's a dietitian. I always say I could never do her job. I could never do your job because so many of the things that you guys deal with are tied to emotion, right? Like you come in the gym and you work out and maybe care about your lifts, but most people don't care, right? Like it's a means to an end, but there's so much emotion tied to eating, right? The things that you like, the way you were brought up, the things you heard about food, like it's just such an emotionally charged topic. How do you, how do you even begin to deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I'd say, you know, for a lot of the athletes that I deal with, there's probably less of like that strong emotional issues going on. Like I, I you would get a lot with people who are very overweight or people who struggle sure. with eating disorders. I mean, that's where it really isn't about the actual food or the fueling. There's there's a deeper kind of emotional issue at heart there. Yeah. But with athletes, you know, again, there's, there's still there's still an underlying connection to why we why we eat the way we eat. And it's funny because to your point, it's just really personal. You know, yes. like you're, you're getting quite personal with someone when you're kind of asking, well, why do you eat this? And why don't you eat that? And, right. you know, and so you are sort of almost, you know, they say don't talk religion and politics at the <laughs> dinner table. I'm sure nutrition's got to be right up there somewhere <laughs> because that's a great way to spoil a, uh, you know, Thanksgiving dinner or weekend. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you do, you, you know, f- forming that connection becomes the most important part. I mean, I find myself now with, you know, athletes, even elite athletes, you know, you spend... 25 minutes talking about them and, and life and everything else. And then the last five minutes, hey, this is what we're going to start with. And off they go. And, and you actually end up with better compliance than have you given them a 15 minute talk on the benefits of and why this and the technicalities of it. Absolutely. I love it, man. Okay. So I got one more question, then we'll kind of start to pull things together yeah. here. But one thing that I love to do in the training side of things is I love to talk about like low hanging fruit or the mm-hmm. easy wins. So if someone's listening to this show, and they just simply want to eat a little bit healthier or they want to feel a bit better. What's some general piece of advice you could give them? One of the concepts that I like to use with, with athletes and mainly in the general population is this concept of master your morning, which is effectively, let's get your breakfast right. And if you're someone who's trying to lose a bit of weight or improve your health, let's just get rid of that morning snack. And so in that way, you, you dial in your breakfast, it becomes automatic. You're not snacking before lunch. You get your coffees, your teas and whatever. And now if once you get that ingrained as a habit, a third of your day is is taken care of. You know, we, we can sort of start to to chop away at the day and just get parts of it that are that are become habits that become habitual. Just like you sit in your car, you, you don't you're not inspired or motivated to put your seatbelt on. You just do it because you you're literally the environment triggers the cue. And so that's what we're trying to get to from a nutrition because we don't want people making nutrition choices every single meal, every single day. There's too much decision fatigue. You know, you'll never win if, if that's the way we go about it. Love it. I love it. Okay. So big question time, my friend. If you could alter the space-time continuum and give young Uh-oh. Mark Bubbs <laughs> one piece of advice about training and or life, what would it be? Whew. This is, uh, hmm. I mean, I'd probably have to say... Uh, you know, just don't rush it. Just go slow. Keep, just keep, <laughs> I think we've talked about this before. Yeah. You know, just keep moving forward. Just like, are you rather moving towards the mountain or away from it? You know, it's like, yes. it's, so I think that's probably one that I uh, probably remind myself every day these days too. But uh, yeah. yeah I, I love that. And like we alluded to before the show in the, the COVID times and navigating everything that's going on, you know, it's definitely not a straight line. Like, let's be realistic here. There's a lot of twists and turns and ups and downs, but 
As long as you're moving in the general direction for the day, I feel like it's a win. There you go. I love it. Okay. Last but not least, we got a lightning round. So in your case, six fairly short questions, but your answers can be as long or short as you'd like. Cool? Sounds good, man. I'll keep it. I'll keep it tight. All right. I love it. <laughs> Number one, what's your career highlight so far as a clinician? Ooh, career highlight. I go general here and just say, you know, being able to to have an impact, to be able to help people change their lives. I mean, whether they're an athlete or a general population, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty cool thing. Absolutely. Perfect. Number two, what's the most common nutrition question you get asked? This is probably tied for, is coffee good for you or bad for you? Or is insert the alcoholic drink of your choice good for you or bad for you? <laughs> Those are definitely the, the top two. What do, you, what do you tell them about coffee? Yeah, I mean, coffee's terrific. I mean, it's loaded with antioxidants, polyphenols. You know, it's tied to things like longevity. We just got to get the dose right, you know. If right. you're if you're getting above five or six milligrams per kg, you're, you're starting to redline and – you know, if you're drinking two or three venties a day, that's probably too much. Yeah. Yeah. When I opened the gym, caffeine intake was at an all time high. Now, much more manageable now. But... <laughs> nice, nice. Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Number I three. I am a coffee lover too. Just you know, full, full disclosure. I, I love it. I love it. Okay. Number three, I want to know your favorite and your least favorite supplement. I think my least favorite has got to be a casein protein supplement just because it's like just drink your milk just eat the cottage cheese you know real food right well that one's kind of the most straightforward one so that would probably be the least favorite my favorite supplement magnesium's got to be up there because it's great for so many different things and people generally feel a lot better when they when they take it initially right they get that little nice little relaxation effect or better sleep that's true that's true nothing better than some good magnesium zinc sleep yeah that combo is pretty sweet okay number four What's the most overhyped idea or concept in nutrition right now? Uh, this one's quite funny because I wrote a whole chapter on it in my book. But <laughs> I, I would say it's the uh, – and this is what we were sort of alluding to in that chapter. But I would say it's the, probably the microbiome. Mm, yeah? The gut, the gut bacteria. It's, it's sort of more the effect than the cause. Okay. I like that. That that chapter is what brought me into the whole book too. I thought that was fascinating. Very cool nice. stuff. Number five, what's your favorite – or who was your favorite basketball player growing up? This is always a funny question because I grew up in Toronto, but this is, you know, I, I played basketball before the Raptors were even a franchise. So okay. I, I was a Pistons fan. So, of course, Michael Jordan's up there, but I'm sure everybody says that. So I'll defer to kind of the, the, the favorite player number two, Joe Dumars. Pistons oh, was, okay. Uh, pretty sweet. The defensive real, stopper. Yeah. Defensive stopper, real closer at the end of games, man. He was, yeah. uh, you know. Didn't, didn't always get the credit, but man, he was a key part of those championship teams, man. Yeah, ironically, he was part of the Jordan rules there, Tick, and beating up on uh, Michael there oh, for those years. Dude, they they used to put some beatdowns on that guy. Yeah, unbelievable. <laughs> okay, awesome. Number six, last but not least, what's next for Dr. Mark Bubbs? What are you working on? What are you excited about? Anything. Yeah, we got some cool uh, continuing education. So doing some performance nutrition, continuing education. And so we got a foundations course all around, all around Peak, which is uh, we had our beta launch, and that'll be coming out in 2021. And we also have a course around performance nutrition in football. So some really you know, fantastic uh, experts in collegiate, NFL, and be coming on board. So if you're interested in, in nutrition and kind of upskilling yourself as a coach or a trainer, then, then definitely uh, check that out. I love it, man. I love it. Well, Mark, you've been great to chat with today. Appreciate your time. Where can my listeners find out more about you and all the great work that you're doing? Well, I got a funny last name. So Bubs is pretty easy to find. So <laughs> at Dr. Bubs on Twitter, uh, uh, Instagram, you can track me down. The website's drbubs.com for all the general health stuff. And if you want to check out more of the performance nutrition athlete stuff, then you can head over to athleteevolution.org. Awesome. Well, we'll make sure we get all those links in the show notes. But again, man, Mark, so great to catch up with you. Thanks so much for your time. You too, man. Appreciate it. my friend that does it for this week's show with dr mark bubbs sincerely hope you enjoyed it like i said up top the guy is a wealth of knowledge but also just has such a balanced viewpoint on nutrition which i personally find very refreshing i think sometimes nutrition gets very polarizing and it's really great to find somebody that's in the trenches doing this at a high level and still has that balanced pragmatic viewpoint when it comes to nutrition so If you enjoyed this episode, I have one of two favors to ask. Number one, if you're not already, take two seconds out of your day and subscribe now. Doesn't matter where you consume podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, Google Play, Amazon, wherever you consume your podcast, you can subscribe there. 
If you are already subscribed, I appreciate it. Thank you. Let's go one step further. If you would go onto iTunes, give me a rating and a review, that would be huge. The more exposure we can get for the show, the more we can positively impact trainers, coaches, rehab professionals to help make our industry a little bit better place, I feel like the better we are going to be as a whole. So my friend, as always, thank you so much for your support. Thanks for listening in this week. Love and appreciate you. And we'll be back soon with our next episode. Take care.